Hello, everyone. If you're watching this video, I'll take a guess that you are very interested to find out what luffs you should be mastering to. There is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of talk online in the forums, and there's a lot, a lot, an abundance of opinions on YouTube as well in regards to what level you should be mastering to. Now, me being me, <laughs> Paul Third, you know, the, the audio geek on YouTube, you won't be surprised to know that I tested the most streamed songs of 2020. I took all 20 and stuck them in Yulene Loudness Meter and I measured every single integral LUFS and then compiled them all. So in the end, we could finally have some sort of average in regards to what level we should be mastering it. So as I have compiled all this information, I have decided to do like a little journey, right? So we'll start off at like the levels, say from the 1980s, then to the 90s, then to the noughties, then kind of like to the modern day, and kind of go through the different stages of the loudness war and kind of certain things that cause the loudness war and generally just have a geeky chat about it. So without further ado, let's get into the 1980s. So obviously the luffs, are going to be lower than compared to modern day because it was different back then, right? It was a different world that we lived in. It was the analog domain, right? There was no digital back then. It was record to the console, into tape, and then put it on to like vinyl. So as you can see, the 80s did not have the headroom of digital because digital wasn't out yet. When you're working in digital, you can go all the way up to zero dBFS. In the analog domain, right, you were working in like VU and DBU, now, think about like analog consoles and stuff and tape, zero VU or like plus four DBU, like dependent on which way you see it. But either way, we were working to analog headroom. <laughs> I say me, <laughs> I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> I was born in 1989. Um, but either way, right, the engineers at that time were working to analog metering, okay, and analog levels. So tracks did have a lot more dynamic range until, right, until we get to the 90s. Now, here's where it starts to get interesting, right? As you'll notice, the level starts to creep up the later we get in the year. So we start off with, like, I Will Always Love You, right? Minus 14.6 with, like, a true peak of minus 1.5. And then we've got, like, Candle in the Wind with the true peak of uh, minus 0 0.1 and a Luffs of uh, minus 11.9. Now, as you can see, there is a massive, massive, massive jump in level from the 80s to the 90s, right? We've got like an average of minus 17 luffs in the 80s to minus 12 and a half luffs in the 90s. Now, did you notice when I was talking about kind of like you got to like 91, 92, 93, 94, and then after 94, woof, everything kind of goes up and the true peak goes up as well. And some of you guys might be wondering, right, so if CDs were around like in the late 80s and kind of really took over like in the early 90s, why did it take to like 1994 for the level of the records to shoot up? Waves released L1, right? We all know the L1 limiter. Engineers were able to limit the dynamic range of their digital files that were going to CD. They had the zero dBFS headroom and they could aim for say like minus 0 0.1 to avoid clipping. But either way, right, minus 10 for me is still quite a good level, right? I still think to this day, minus 10 lofts isn't too crushed sound in. If I listen to a lot of these records on Spotify, I still think they sound pretty damn good and they don't really sound that over limited in my personal opinion. However, <laughs> we then get into the proper loudness wars. 99, like, woof, right into the noughties. Shit just went mental and the noughties created the loudness wars, right? Where records were louder, but the dynamic range was clamped so much that everything started sounding squashed and just completely overdone. Just have a look <laughs> at these measurements. By the way, for anybody asking why they're all pop punk, right? I just, when I think noughties, I think about songs that were really popular around that time that big mix and engineers mixed, and the pop punk thing was fucking huge, right? My wife was daft over it. So I picked like the best selling albums and artists and kind of picked their biggest songs, okay? So as we can see, 1999, right? <laughs> Blink-182, minus 6.9 lofts. And look, right? Look. 0 0.3. That's right. Overs, right? It's overshooting, okay? Or clipping, right? Spotify. So you go to 2001, 2002, as you can see, minus 7.7. .7. Good Charlotte, minus 6.5. Minus 7.2. American Idiot, 2004, minus 6. And again, look, 0 0.3, and we're clipping Spotify. So if you think about where we started, right, in the 80s, we had 
minus 17 luffs, minus 14, 15 luffs early 90s, kind of going towards like minus 10 luffs in the like late 90s. And then <laughs> in the noughties, we've got records like minus 6 LUFS. And the thing that might be kind of scratching your brain a little bit if you don't know much about like mastering and stuff is why is the true peak level showing over 0 dB full scale? Now, what I found out recently is that even if your DAW shows that a record isn't clipping, it can still clip due to what people call intersample peaks, which comes from like additional like sample peaks brought in by D to A conversion, so your digital to analog conversion. So if you think about phone speakers and crappy speakers and TV speakers and just generally like crap audio systems, right? Their conversion is terrible. So on systems that cost thousands and thousands, you won't hear any distortion and in your head you'll be like, on my system, it's not clipping. There's a reason why Spotify advise you when you're mastering songs to be uploaded to Spotify that you set your true peak to minus one or minus two dB. Now the reason that they advise this is because of Spotify's own conversion. So Spotify's conversion will raise the true peaks. It will add like inter sample peaks or whatever with its conversion. Now from what I've read, it was very common for a lot of mastering guys to like set their ceiling to like minus 0 0.1 dBFS in the limiter. Because in their eyes they were like, right, if I do that, then that's the ceiling and it's not going to go above 0 dBFS and it's not going to clip. Now, theoretically, that makes absolute sense, but, but, we go back to conversion and we think about what happened in the noughties, right? I was a noughties boy, right? We think about MP3s, uh, files being illegally downloaded, MP3s, right? Lossy codecs, right? Crappy conversion. So if you think about taking a song that's been pushed to its maximum, right? Minus 0 0.1, you add in any more like intersample peaks on top of that via crappy conversion, then it's going to go over and it's going to distort. So conversion plays a massive part in today's world. And it was probably something from the outset these guys didn't expect. I mean, you think about like, did anybody see the MP3 <laughs> becoming as big as it did? Illegal downloading and stuff, right? Nobody knew what was going to happen with the internet, right? The internet just kind of went crazy and then piracy was absolutely crazy. Right? We think about the LimeWire days, you know what I mean? Like we all fucking did it. Like fucking hell, I'm 15. <laughs> I'm not I'm not, I've not got money to buy fucking like an album for 18 quid. Fuck, look if I get fucking 10 pound fucking pocket money a month. So a lot of these tracks were getting converted to MP3s and they sounded shit, they were clipping and they were distorting. Which is why when I measured a lot of these big naughty songs, these pop punk songs, they're actually clipping in Spotify because there is not enough headroom, right? There is nowhere near enough headroom for Spotify, so you're getting overs due to the Spotify conversion, right? There's not enough headroom in these noughties masters. Now, there is an argument made by many that uh, phone speakers have got that much of a shit. <laughs> They're only tiny things. Their DA conversion is that shit that everything kind of distorts anyway. So what does it matter if it distorts? Like PC monitor speakers and laptop speakers, they're shit and they're going to distort anyway. So what's the point of it clips? Me personally, I disagree, I disagree with that. Because in my opinion, it shouldn't be clipping or you shouldn't be adding in distortion. Like you should, you just shouldn't be, right? Especially just for the sake of loudness. And this is something that was remedied. We had the loudness war with Naughties and we move on to like the songs that have had the most digital sales of all time. Now, most of these, I'm pretty sure, I think, it's like, it's around like 2014, 2017 period. That top one, I have no, I have no idea what it is, but it's the highest selling like digital sales of all time. Knows what it is. But like, like Ed Sheeran, Shape of You, Despacito, Work, um, Chainsmokers and Coldplay, Ed Sheeran again, See You Again, Rolling in the Deep, got Adele, Uptown Funk. And what's interesting is that if we look at the average, the average is minus 8.95. Call it minus nine luffs. Right, that's three dB quieter than the noughties. Right, and these are the biggest selling digital records of all time. And what you'll also notice is that we have no overs on any track. It stopped, completely stopped. So as we can see, like in the 2000s, it was very, very crushed. Records were crushed, over limited, and they were right at the edge of like um, digital headroom. We kind of move more into the next decade. Streaming platforms are way more popular and the mastering engineers have adapted 
to where their audience is listening to the music. And this brings me to the final test, which was what this video was only meant to be about, um, which is me measuring the integral LUFS of the 20 most streamed songs of last year. Surely, surely we haven't went back the way. <laughs> Just have a look at this. And unbelievably, fucking records have gotten laughter. Oh my god, we are actually going back the way. Think about five years ago, right? We were kind of around like the minus nine luffs mark and now we're averaging at like minus eight luffs. And look, there are actually records with overs in them. I've spoke to a few mastering engineers and they told me that Yulene Loudness Meter is very, very unforgiving <laughs> when it comes to like clipping and overs. So it's maybe not as bad as what we think and it might just be kind of like... Kind of like just like certain levels, just very, very short clips you're probably not going to hear. I can't really say that for sure, but in my opinion, I don't think any of these should be clipping Spotify. So as we can see, the loudness wars aren't actually <laughs> getting any better. We are actually getting louder. There are records being made that are minus 11, minus 10, minus 9, and I think what it does go to show is that your record does not need to be minus fucking six, right? Or minus seven. It doesn't need to be. Tiesto record is minus nine luffs, right? Tiesto, for fuck's sake. And if you look at it, like, in regards to modern day, only the big, big, big artists and their big kind of dancey tracks are like minus six. Don't do minus six unless you know what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> don't do it. Your record will probably sound shit because you don't know what you're doing. It's not a qualitative thing. It is genuinely like a dick swinging thing. That's all it is. It's all psychoacoustical bullshit. They understand that we as humans, right, we perceive things that are louder to be better. By the way, um, if you're on like the web browser or you're using like third party things like TVs and like other like speakers and shit, the auto normalization thing doesn't work. That's why I was able to get the all the readings that I was able to get because <laughs> I was using the web browser, which is what I fucking use all the time. So auto normalization, like the minus 14 thing, it's not always on. It's not always on because it's dependent on how you're listening to Spotify. When you're limiting stuff, don't think about loudness, right? Think about how loud you can get the track. Don't look at numbers. Don't look at meters, right? Don't have in your head this has to be minus six, has to be minus eight, has to be fucking minus seven, has to be minus four. It's bullshit. The, the top most streamed songs of last year, none of them went above fucking minus six. None of them, right? None of them. People could say EDM and stuff like that. I'm not fucking getting into that. I let Dan Morrow deal with shit like that. Um, but I would say when it comes to like your own songs and maybe other people's stuff if you're starting out as a mastering engineer, listen to the song and make the song as loud as it can be without losing quality. There is a limit to limiting, right? There is a certain point where it is too crushed, it is too limited because you might not know what you're doing. You don't know how to get extra bit of loudness without losing quality. A lot of the mastering engineers I speak to will be like, well, I don't give a shit. Like a record that I did was minus 13. The next one was minus nine. The next one was minus 12. Every track is different and should be treated so. Think about that. Every track is different. If you've got like a piano ballad, right? You're not going to fucking go minus six, minus seven, minus eight. Look at Adele. What was Adele? Minus 9.4. That was as loud as they could get it without kind of losing on quality. Compression limits dynamic range, right? On a song that's like an acoustic song that's just a piano and a vocal, especially like really stunningly beautiful vocals, right? You want that dynamic range. You don't want the dynamic range to be crushed. You want it to be loud and competitive, but the quality always has to come through. Don't think loudness, think quality. In a sense, you're still thinking loudness because that's your job, but quality comes first, loudness comes second. And I'm not going to say that, yeah, go for minus eight luffs because the average from last year was minus eight. Treat every song as an individual song. Remember, guys, this is just a discussion. I'm not telling you what to do. You do what you do. There's the stats. There's the numbers. Be constructive, right? Be nice in the comments. Let me know your thoughts down below. My name is Paul Third, and I will see you again next week on Mixing Wednesdays.